It's good to see all of you tonight. You can take out your Bibles and turn to 1 John 5. You may want to leave a marker there. We'll leave and then we'll come back to it. I think it's an interesting passage. I wanted to give it some time tonight. Before I begin, though, it'd be hard for me not to say anything about Sister Annette, who's passing this past week. Um, many of y'all remember Miss Annette McKee. It wasn't too long ago that she moved down to Prattville to live closer with Mr. Philip, her son. Uh, every time I saw her at Prattmont, she'd always say, y'all haven't forgotten about me up there, have you? And I always thought it was wild that, like, Annette would think that we would forget about her, <laughs> but, but we never forgot about Annette. Uh, I think I'd be hard-pressed to find any sister that I know or that I've known in my life that was more influential than her. Uh, she had lived everywhere. She had met everybody, and she had studied with everybody. Um, there's a lot of local churches all throughout South Alabama that exist because of the work that Pete and Annette did, and I'm very thankful and very grateful that I've gotten to know her and be influenced by her even before I met her. Um, she's hard boots to fill. But I do think that a lot of sisters here, ever since she got weaker, have really risen to the occasion and tried to fill Annette's boots. And I thank you for that. And I think we're all better off when of our sisters have tried to do some of the things that Annette used to do for this group. And I'm thankful for you as well. But certainly thankful that we all plan to see her again because of the promises of our Lord Jesus Christ. Let's look at 1 John chapter 5. And you'll read this with me. Verse 18 is how he closes up the book. He says, we know that whoever is born of God does not sin, but he who has been born of God keeps himself, and the wicked one does not touch him. We know that we are of God, and the whole world lies under the sway of the wicked one. And we know that the Son of God has come and given us an understanding that we may know him who is true, and we are him who is true, in his son, Jesus Christ. This is the true God and eternal life. If you start back up verse 18 again, he says, we know that whoever is born of God does not sin, but instead keeps himself. And John makes these bold statements. What he doesn't mean is if you're with God, that you're never ever gonna sin ever again on earth. That's not the point he's making. The point he's making is if you really do have a relationship with God, you're going to stick with God no matter what happens at the end of the day. And that if you even if you do sin, you're going to repent, you're going to make things right, because even then you are still desiring to be in a relationship with God. You're going to work that out. So that's someone who knows God, who's born of God. They're the way they do not sin. But look at verse 19, and it's really what I want to focus on for the rest of the time we have. Verse 19 says, we know that we are of God. And the whole world lies under the sway of the wicked one. And the contrast to that is, but the Son has come and given us truth. But there's a thought here in verse 19 that we know we're of God, but the world and everybody else who doesn't know God lies under the sway of the wicked one. That's terrifying. Now, the sway there, under the sway, if you're reading the King James, New King James like me, you'll see it's italics. John didn't put the sway in there. That's something a translator put in there to try to explain the Greek to us. However, I thought it was pretty clever that there's a concept here that God controls his people, but the wicked one controls everybody else. And that's something I wanted to explore, that there is a sway. There's a sway in this world that Satan is in control over, and we can be easily influenced by that sway unless we know God. And so let's explore that. Uh, We'll be looking at the things that those sways can be. Uh, In the middle, we'll talk about what's the solution. And there at the very end, I want to talk about how sometimes we can go even a little too far in the other direction. And then the lesson will be yours. First thing I want to do is talk about what that sway is, or maybe some ways that that sway of the wicked one can affect you and me. And I got a couple of these. I think I have five of them. But the first one is in Ephesians chapter 2 that the wicked one can sway us or he does sway the world just via the desires that we have and that sometimes we're even born with. Look at Ephesians chapter two. Instead of calling him the wicked one, Paul here is gonna call him the prince and the power of the air, which is obviously just talking about Satan. But look what he says here in verses one through three. 
He says, in you he made alive, who were dead in trespasses and sin, in which you once walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince and the power of the air, the spirit who now works in the sons of disobedience. Let me pause. He brings up a thought that there's a course of the world. There's a way that the world flows. There's a way that the world moves. And unless the Lord comes and helps you, you're going to stick in that course of the world. You're not going to know any different than just to do what everybody else is doing, right? Verse 3 explains what that course is. Among whom also we once conducted ourselves in the lust of our flesh, fulfilling the desires of the flesh and of the mind, and were by nature children of wrath, just as the others. Paul's writing to these Gentile Christians saying, you used to live for whatever you thought would make you happy. And that was your only considerations in making choices. That you were born with these desires, you were hungry, and so you went and got something to eat. You lusted, so you took, right? You didn't care who got hurt. You coveted what you wanted, And so you robbed and you stole or you cheated to get what you coveted for. And he's saying basically by nature, if you were born into this world and God never came and tried to influence us with his word, then that's exactly where we would be. We would just be, and I think the word is, selfish. And whatever you want, you go take and you don't care anything about it. Does Satan kind of affect us that way or can he affect us that way? I think absolutely he can, right? He knows, or at least he can tell what our desires are. He knows the things that we're tempted with in our own selfishness. And don't be surprised when those things appear right in front of you for the take. Do you think it was an accident that David saw Bathsheba bathing? You know, was that just a coincidence? Or did Satan maybe know that's exactly what David was looking for? And there's certainly even more Bible stories that we could go to to talk about. Well, it's funny that they found exactly what they were being selfish for. And right there, that's an easy way. There's just a desire for the world. There's a desire for selfishness. And unless I stick with the living Lord, it's very easy to slip into simple desires that we're born with and not thinking of the bigger picture. And number two, going along with this desire of the world, he can sway me that way but he also can sway me with just general peer pressure. That it's not just that I desire the world, but sometimes I desire to fit in with the world. Look at Galatians 2 with me. Galatians chapter 2. Turn backwards one book. Peter is here being told a story about that he came and joined up with Paul and Barnabas in Antioch. And Peter, the apostle, you know, in all of his understanding and in his might that we appreciate him for, still just succumbed to peer pressure and took Barnabas along with him. There's a conversation here in chapter 2 about the prejudices of the Jews on the Gentiles, and it seems like Peter joined in in some of that prejudice. Verse 11, now when Peter had come to Antioch, I withstood him to his face because he was to be blamed. For before certain men came from James, he would eat with the Gentiles. But when they came, he withdrew and separated himself, fearing those who were of the circumcision. And the rest of the Jews also played the hypocrite with him, so that even Barnabas was carried away with their hypocrisy. There's a story being painted for us that Paul has come to Antioch and he's met these Gentile Christians and he's sitting with them, and he's eating with them, and they're enjoying each other's company. But then men come from James. And what I take that to mean is these are Jewish Christians from Jerusalem, where James, the brother of Jesus, was located. And when these Jewish Christians arrive to the party, or they get together, what does Peter do? Peter immediately separates himself from the Gentiles that he was sitting with and goes and joins those Jews. And evidently through their conversation or whatnot, Paul sees that they're all playing the hypocrite and that even Barnabas comes and joins in this prejudice to make fun of the Gentile Christians that Peter just separated himself from. What did Peter do? Peter knew better, but fearing the desire to fit in, he just went ahead and he played the hypocrite. Barnabas too. Can Satan sway us just with our peers? Of course he can. 
And I think it's very funny when some of us argue, well, you know, peer pressure really doesn't affect me. I'm not really affected by my peers. But here's the Apostle Peter falling in sin because he too was affected by his peers. I don't know why any of us can make that claim. No, we are affected by the people that we're around. And the people we're around a lot. Now, let me take this a step further, though. Were these people just like worldly people that just showed up and pressured Peter into doing this sinful action? Were these some like bandits? You know, were these just some like wild folks out from the heather that showed up and they, they convinced Peter? No, who are the people that convinced Peter to do this sinful thing? It was his brethren, right? And, and are y'all with me on that? That that's what the men from James mean? That it was his brethren that pressured him into doing this thing. It wasn't from the world. And, and maybe some of y'all on a Sunday night are sort of like me in this boat. That there was a time in high school, maybe older high school, or maybe early college, sometime in that area for me, that, that I just kind of came to the realization that the world really couldn't pressure me to do much. And this is what I mean by that. I remember sitting in a class, and I'm sitting with people that, you know, are obviously in the world, associated with the world, and I just kind of come to the realization that I don't respect a single person in this room. <laughs> and I don't mean like in the sense of like, I don't treat them like they should be treated. I mean respect in the sense that I don't respect any of their opinions. And that they're worldly people, they don't believe in Jesus, or they don't believe anything that Jesus taught. Why do I even care about anything they have to say? And literally, any of them could try to pressure me into do anything, and I wouldn't do it just in spite of them. And I remember specifically this kid named Ryan. Someone had told me, hey, Andrew, you should do this. Come, we're going to hang out, you know, come, you know, here's the place, yada, yada, yada. Ryan yells out, don't bother asking Andrew. You could beg him as much as you want. He won't come. He's got his other friends. He doesn't care a thing about us. And I remember saying, no, no, I care about y'all. And in my mind, though, I'm thinking, man, this Ryan kid has got me dead figured out. I've got to watch him, you know? Like, that's creepy how he just, he nailed me. I didn't care about any of them. <laughs> you know, I had my other friends. You know, I had friends that believed in Jesus. I had friends that were my brethren. And if I had free time, I was going to go hang out with them. I'm going to go hang out with these fools. They're bandits. And maybe some of y'all are even sitting in that boat right now. You know, if a whole bunch of worldly people showed up from work, they had zero influence on you. But who does have real influence on you? The brethren have real influence on you because you respect and value their opinions. Now, we usually go from there that that's a really good thing, that it's good to be influenced by good Christian brethren. And don't get me wrong, that is a good thing. However, look at Fred Peter here. Who was the problem? Where did the sway come from? It came from brethren. And even with brethren, Satan can sway us to do evil things. And that, that's something I think that we just need at least to consider. And, and let me say one more thing about this before I move on. And please pay attention if you're not, so you do not misquote me later. But th there's something we need to at least consider, especially if we're young, that maybe some of these Christian schools that we have throughout the world or throughout the country may not be a good idea for every single one of us. And this is what I mean by that. As someone that has gone to worldly schools and gone to hint on hint Christian schools, I've done both. When I go to worldly schools, I have my guard up 24 seven. I don't believe anything they say. And they have very inf little influence on me. But I went to Christian schools, or what I mean by Christian schools is everybody in that room believes that you have to be baptized to be saved. That's what I mean. I don't mean necessarily disciples. But when I'm in those rooms, guess what happens? Andrew puts his guard down. Because I'm with people that believe in Acts 2.38. Where was the more dangerous room for me? Well, it was the room I put my guard down in. And what was the most dangerous room for Peter here? It was the room that he put his guard down in. And I just think that's something to consider. We may all be different in terms of where we're at on that, but I would just want us to consider it. There are places that are full of brethren that might be dangerous for us. 
because of some of the beliefs or the ideals or what we could be pressured into be doing and Satan could use as a sway. Let's look at a third one here. What about fear of conflict? You know, can Satan use our own personal fear and anxiety of being in conflict with someone to sway us to do something we don't need to do? And going from that, what about fear of a discussion even? That we're afraid to even have a discussion with someone. Let's turn to 1 Peter 3. Uh, Y'all that go to boys' class know that I was going to use this example because I I pulled the audience and I asked them about this. I saw a video the other day of a middle school teacher talking about how all of his students wear their iPhone earbuds, or at least knockoff iPhone earbuds. Uh, And they wear their earbuds 24-7. They just keep them in their ears. And I asked the boys in boys' class, do y'all see that too? And they said, oh, yeah, yeah, you know. Anybody that's going anywhere in high school, we're wearing our earbuds. Like, that's just what we're supposed to do. And I had made the comment, you know, is this like a fashion thing? Like, I mean, is this just like earrings or something? Like, everybody's got to wear their earbuds? My understanding is, is a lot of the kids aren't even listening to anything. They just got their earbuds in because they're supposed to have their earbuds in because everybody else does. And, And I didn't make fun of them too much. When I was in junior high school, we all wore shell choker necklaces like we were surfers. You know, and we lived in the dead heart middle of Alabama. (laughs) Like, we weren't surfers, but we wore our necklaces. Why? Because everybody else was wearing their necklace. Somebody showed up without your necklace. Hey, where's your necklace? Do you want me to go borrow my second one? I keep in my backpack. You know, like, it was a concern. And I I thought, okay, well, maybe this is just what a new thing is. But Sherry gave me something different, didn't she? And it was pretty good. I'm going to share that one instead. (laughs) Let's throw my idea away. It's an anxiety thing. That's why you keep your earbuds in. Why would it be an anxiety thing to keep your earbuds in when you're at school and walking around? What are you telling everybody when you have your headphones in? You're telling them, don't talk to me. And I think that might be for at least some of us, that's why we do that sort of thing. It's an anxiety thing that we're afraid of conflict. We're afraid of discussion. And that's the world we live in. Now, don't get me wrong. That doesn't mean we all need to be happy-go-friendly 100% of the time. It's okay to listen to music sometimes. It's okay to tell people I need a break. I'm not trying to go this route. I'm going through the route of we're going to have to be able to have at least some discussions with some people. Look at 1 Peter 3 with me. Look at verse 13. We all know this passage. Verse 13 says, And who is he who will harm you if you become followers of what is good? But even if you should suffer for righteousness' sake, you are blessed. And do not be afraid of their threats, nor be troubled, but sanctify the Lord God in your hearts and always be ready to give a defense to everyone who asks you for a reason for the hope that is within you with meekness and fear, having a good conscience that when they defame you as an evildoer, those who revile your good conduct in Christ may be ashamed, for it is better if the will of God to suffer for doing good than for doing evil. Here in the center of this passage, verse 15, you know, sanctify the Lord God in your heart because when they revile you and they make accusations and they have a conflict with you, when they accuse you, when they want to have a question, when they even have a discussion, what does Peter ask you to be ready to do there in this verse 15? He says, have a ready defense for the hope that's within you. Now, that doesn't mean having an answer to every question right off the bat, does it? No, what that means is is being able to explain some of the basic reasons for why you do what you do, right? And, And those basic answers should have something to do at least with Jesus. If you're not gonna have discussions with people and you're gonna be completely closed off from the world, if you're not willing to even have any kind of conflict with someone, where you would eventually have to have a discussion about why you chose to do the things you chose to do. Can you have a ready defense for the hope that's within you? No, you avoid any opportunity to share that hope. (laughs) So can Satan have sway of you that way? Where he can say, well, Andrew, he doesn't have discussions with anybody. He stays away from conflict at all possible. You know what? He's off the chessboard. I think that's a possibility as well, that that could be the sway of the world and almost like an anti-peer pressure where we're not willing to do anything. And again, it's just something to consider 
of a way that the wicked one could be swaying us in our lives. And finally, let me do one more. Uh, Let me use the word indoctrination. You know, the concept we just made about fear of conflict and fear of discussion is, is that Satan could use those fears against us to keep us silent about things we need to be talking about. And, and the concept we pull out of 1 Peter 3 is that we need to be able to answer why sometimes. Not necessarily what would be the best answer of this particular subject, but why am I doing the things I'm doing? We need to be able to answer that question. The definition of indoctrination is not oh, they're teaching you something that I disagree with. They're indoctrinating you because that's the way that we use the word today. We use doctrine to talk about good things and we use indoctrination to talk about something negative that we don't like. But my understanding is the real definition of the word indoctrination is teaching something without the why or teaching something without the critical thinking behind it. Whereas you were taught something, you were drilled something, but no one explained to you logically how you got there to that answer. So what's indoctrination missing? It's the why. Why are we doing this, right? Why should we be doing this? And those questions never get answered. Can the gospel be turned into some kind of sickly indoctrination, at least in terms of our teaching? Yes, it can. If I only teach the practices and I never teach why we're doing the practices, that could turn into some type of indoctrination. But even as Peter says, we're supposed to teach people about the hope behind the doctrine. That's not indoctrination. Can Satan use indoctrination to sway me to where he wants me to be? Of course he can. Have we been indoctrinated to believe things and do things, whether it be the school system or the legal system or the TV or the news or by the Internet? Y'all, we've all been indoctrinated. There's probably some things we believe and we have no idea why we believe them. And I don't necessarily know what those things are. Why? Because I've probably been indoctrinated in some things too that I don't even know about. But I think the solution to keep Satan from making us believe whatever doctrine he's got on the menu every 10 years is to constantly be asking the question about my beliefs, why? Why do I believe this? Do I believe it just because that's what the guy on the news told me to believe? Or do I actually have a logical reason for believing that? Why do I believe this thing? Is it because I read it out of the Bible and I understand it? Or is it just because this is the going traditional belief on this particular topic? Those are two different things. And again, I think that's something we need to consider that these are devices that Satan could use as the wicked one to sway us back into the world uh, where he wants to keep us. So what's the solution? Well, the solution is uh, 1 John 5. We've already read it, but now let's read it again. Look back to 1 John 5. Hopefully you kept your marker there. Verse 18, he says, We know that whoever is born of God does not sin, but he who is born of God keeps himself, and the wicked one does not touch him. We know that we are of God, and the whole world lies under the sway of the wicked one. And we know that the Son of God has come and giving us an understanding that we may know him who is true and we are in him who is true in his Son, Jesus Christ. This is the true God in eternal life. That first part, he tells us way we can escape this way. One, you can be born of God. And I take that to mean what Jesus meant about that from John chapter 3, to be born of water and spirit to obey the gospel, to be baptized, and to be in fellowship with God. Because the one who's been born of God, even though he might sin again, he can keep himself in God because he has access to forgiveness of sins. He has access to the blood of the covenant. And certainly I can escape the sway if I know that I can win this thing, that I can reach a heavenly goal, that I can be with God for eternal life regardless of my weaknesses. Because... I've been born of God. So if you haven't been born of God yet, you can't even get any further, can you? That's step number one, to obey the gospel and to access that covenant with God. Number two, he said here in 1 John 5, you've got to know that we are of God, right? Now the whole other world, they underlie us, are under the sway of the wicked one, but I'm not of the world, I'm of God. But it's not just to say it, it's to know it. 
I know that we are of God, right? What is the best defense against peer pressure? And I already kind of mentioned it when we read Galatians 2. The, the best defense against peer pressure in my mind is to know you're a part of a different group. You know, this group's opinion I know is wrong, but I've gotten to the point now I don't respect this group's opinion. Why? Because I'm part of this other group over here that's better. I, I think in my mind that's the solution, and I think that's the solution here. How can a person reject the sway of the wicked one? He says, well, I don't respect the wicked one's opinion. I'm part of this group over here, and this is the group where God is at. I'm a part of that group. And if I know that I am of God, well, is there not a better group to be a part of? You know, this is the group that's going to have eternal life. This is the group that has all the wisdom and all the truth that God's given it. This is a much better group to be in. And maybe I'll lose interest in trying to desire to be any kind of group that the world offers, even when that world group may even include brethren. Number three, because the Son of God has come and giving us an understanding. What do we talk about indoctrination? Indoctrination, there is no why. There is no how. There is no explain it to me. But the Son of God, what did He do? He gave us an understanding. The Son of God came and he answered the question, why? He answered the question, how, right? It's not indoctrination. It's just good, sound doctrine. And certainly the Son of God has provided us. And then we can know that he is true. And finally, this is the true God and eternal life. I'll tell you what, eternal life is a pretty big motivator to stay out of the sweat. I don't know about you. Y'all feel the same way? Like living forever with the Lord, I mean, that's a pretty good offer. And I think a lot of us, you know, even in our hardest moments, we stick it out. Why? Because when we die, we don't want to go to hell. When we die, we want to go to heaven. So we stick with it. And I think John here at the very end of his book, he's like, hey, let me just be honest. This is why y'all are all here. You know that God offers you eternal life and you want to take the deal. And it's a good deal to take, isn't it? And I think at the end of the day, that's a good way, an easy way to escape this way. Well, let's move forward now that we understand the gist of the book or this little section, you know, we end up getting to a place where we might take this too far. And I want to come back and bring it back to the middle and just stay in 1 John 5. Uh, last Tuesday night, for y'all that came, uh, we made the point that the Bible or Bible study has earthly advantages that's not the primary purpose of Bible study. And, and when simply, we just made the point that for a society that's interested in studying the Bible, they start teaching the kids how to read. And that becomes very important, you know, like, hey, you need to learn how to read so you can read the Bible. Now, the objective and the primary purpose of that is for spiritual things. But there's some secondary things that happen that are blessings that you really weren't trying to get, aka you just made your whole society literate. And at least in terms of education and in terms of wealth opportunities, you just increase the level of your society even though you're really just trying to teach them the Bible. And so we kind of made the point that sometimes there's earthly advantages to things that God has given us for spiritual objectives. Well, certainly with this, this is also sort of where that goes. Jesus, when he's told us, hey, you can come be part of my group, you can reject the group that you're in, you can come and you can seek things with me, he kind of gave some of us a superpower. And what that superpower is, is we don't care about what anybody has to say about us. And maybe not all of us are there right now, but I tell you what, you stick with Jesus, you will get there. I think a lot of us here have gotten to the point that we just simply don't care anymore what anybody in the world has to say about us. And, and people could come in here and say that we're ugly and we're fat and we're stupid for following Jesus, and we literally could not care because we've already know that we are of God. And, and those insults would just kind of hit us and fall over. And, and as Christians, it, it's sort of like a secondary thing that we've received that really wasn't the primary purpose, but, you know, it's, it's what happened. Can we all take that a little too far, though? Do you know, brethren, that just simply don't care about anybody and anything? Is that exactly where the apostles and the Holy Spirit wants us to be? We can take that a little too far where we become resistant to all sways because we're trying to stop the sway of the wicked one. 
You know, we can use our Christian liberty to excuse ourselves from any type of change. And I think this is what Peter is warning us about in 1 Peter chapter 2. 1 Peter chapter 2, just flip two books backwards. Verse 11, he says, Beloved, I beg you as sojourners and pilgrims to abstain from fleshly lusts which war against the soul. Pause. What did he just tell us? Escape the sway of the wicked one, right? We know that. Verse 12, having your conduct honorable among the Gentiles, that when they speak against you as evildoers, they may by your good works which they observe glorify God in the day of visitation. Pause. What do you just tell them? The Gentiles come in and they say ugly things about you and guess what? You don't care, right? Because your conduct is going to be honorable where they will have to glorify God eventually. Verse 13, therefore submit yourself to every ordinance for the Lord's sake. Well, hold on just a second. Peter, I thought you were talking about how we shouldn't care about anybody or anything except the Lord. And then what does he say in verse 13? Now you just go ahead and you submit to every ordinance for the Lord's sake, whether to the king or supreme, 14, or to governors, as those who are sent by him for a punishment of the evildoer and for the praise of those who do good. For this is the will of God, that by doing good, you may put to silence the ignorance of foolish men as free yet not using liberty as a cloak for vice, but as bondservants of God. Honor all people, love the brotherhood, fear God, honor the king. Peter, does he know what we're about? Yeah, he does. He says, you know what? I know some of y'all picked up that superpower and you don't care about what anybody says about you. And you've now taken that to the level where even those of authority that God has ordained to have authority, at least the position, that you also don't care anything about they say, and you're just using your liberty in Christ as a cloak for vice. And there are brethren in this world that use their liberty in Christ as a cloak for vice, and they did it too in the first century. That's taking this too far. Where now we're just escaping any type of authority or any type of sway this over. It's just because it wasn't in the Bible. You know, we'll we'll also do this. We use our developed resistance to fight against the work of the Lord. Where we become so resistant to any kind of change or any kind of influence, we become so resistant to any type of persuasion from anybody that we'll even hinder the work of the Lord. 1 Corinthians 15, 58, it's just one verse. And again, you probably know it. But verse 58, he says, Therefore, my beloved brethren, be steadfast, immovable, And for us that have that superpower, we love that, right? I'm steadfast. I'm immovable. But what's the next thing he says? Always abounding in the work of the Lord. To kind of take this a little bit trivial, just to give us a little bit of an example. You know, 10 years ago, there were brethren that were very resistant to us using the Facebook website for evangelism purposes. You know, they were very resistant to that. And they said, you know, we shouldn't dive any money into it. We shouldn't even try to figure it out. We should discourage brethren from using it. That that's something that doesn't work. We need to stick with this gospel meeting system. And if we just stick with the gospel meeting system, we'll be able to make some contacts and get some studies going. Now, don't get me wrong. All of these avenues are ways you can get studies. I'm not trying to down one. But they were resistant to it. Why? Because it was a change. It was something new. They weren't interested. And brethren would come to him and say, I really think we should try this. I think I could get some context this way. Well, what did they do? Well, they used their little superpower, and they're like, well, I don't care what you think or you say. (laughs) I'll be fine. And they wouldn't take any type of persuasion at all, even though we're talking about being within the bounds of God's law. What's the issue? The issue is we're turning the work of the Lord away so we can stick to the things that we've enjoyed and we like. Is that an issue? That is an issue. It's also an issue when you've had tons of gospel meetings and you're still thinking about evangelism with gospel meetings instead of edification, and you still really think that you're going to bring in context that way, which let's face it, the past couple of 10 years, we haven't gotten context from gospel meetings. They haven't really been an evangelistic effort. They've been more of an edification effort. But, but we're not abounding in the work of the Lord, so we can keep to our old ways. What's funny about all that is now 10 years later, you've got the same brethren that are telling you, we really need to invest in Facebook. And if we will just invest in Facebook, Andrew, we will be able to get so many contacts. I'm looking at them like, Facebook's dead, man. Half of everybody's a bot. 
Or they're over 80. Yeah, you know, like, sure, yeah, we'll put some stuff up on Facebook, but I'm not thinking I'm going to get all these contacts from Facebook. You know, in 10 years, we've completely flipped, and it's the young generation saying, no, get off the Internet. Right? Well, what's the issue? The issue is when we start putting those barriers up, and we're not even willing to have conversations about the work of the Lord because we're able to be resistant to everything. When really, our priority should be the work of the Lord and whatever mediums or avenues we can use to abound in the work of the Lord. Sometimes we've even developed a resistance to God's Word, where we've believed things the same way for our entire lives. And even though we've been shown passages that we've never considered, we really don't care because we don't care about anybody or anything. And that way, again, we're resisting a sway. But the sway is from God. What a terrible place to be. We're we're sort of using our own advantages that God has given us against them. But we would know the answer to that. We're not supposed to resist the Lord. We're supposed to resist the wicked one. And that's why he's taught us those things. And that's why he says what he says in verse 20 of 1 John 5. And we know that the Son of God has come and given us an understanding that we may know him who is true and we are in him who is true, in his son, Jesus Christ, that the son of God came to give us an understanding of truth. And true is true, even if it's something we already know. And truth is true, even if it's something we haven't discovered yet. But the son of man came to give us what? Not resistance. He came us to give us truth. And that's the one thing I can never be resistant to. Thank you for your close attention. And as you can see there, I wanted to balance it on the other side. We're only singing the chorus at the end. And I'll, I'll agree with Adam. I think that this song is a lot better when you sing and you save the chorus for the end. So I'm, I'm excited about that. If there's anyone here tonight that needs to be born of God and you understand what that means, and you understand that Jesus Christ came to give us that understanding, then why don't you take this advantage tonight? We can obey the gospel tonight if anyone has the desire to. But if there's also people that have the question why, this is not a place of indoctrination. This is a place where we like to tell you why we believe the things that we believe. And if you're looking for a why, please come and talk to one of us, and we love to give you that answer of why we believe the things we believe. If there's any way we can spiritually assist, why don't you come forward as we stand and sing? Thank you.